Property management is our leading source of complaints against real estate brokers, which it was a big source of complaints when I started at the commission. Um, so one of the things that we're working on, instead of kind of going down the road immediately of specialty license types, is we kind of want to work on the motto that is expressed to people going through school to become a real estate broker. And I know that it sticks with me, and I remember my instructor saying it, um, once you get the real estate broker's license, it's good for anywhere in the state to do anything that requires a real estate broker's license. I think that can be a little misleading, and I think that's one of the leading causes of why we get those complaints about property management. A lot of the time, our, our complaints can be very reflective of the industry trends. So when you've got a downturn in sales and you start to see an increase in property management, we start to see an increase in property management complaints, although they seem to be a regular source of complaints year after year. So what we typically see one of the leading issues with property management is unlicensed activity. For some reason, the general public seems to think that they don't need to have any sort of professional credential to go out and help their neighbor rent their property or ha help Aunt Betty rent her property. When the case is you've got to have the real estate broker's license to rent the property that belongs to somebody else. Next in line with the property management issues is we see the sales brokers decide to dabble in property management to kind of make up for the, the downturn in their sales income, so they're going to go after the steady property management income. Not realizing that really the nuances of the relationships that you have with consumers between sales and property management tend to be quite different. You get to deal with the sales, you may deal with them once. And if you're lucky, it's not once over the you know, period of years. Property management, that's going to be a long-term relationship, and they're going to blame you for everything under the sun. The damage done by the tenant, standard wear and tear, who they select as a tenant. And one of the things with the real estate brokers that practice sales, or particularly residential sales, there seems to be a pattern of standard industry practices that we at the division can go, oh, well, you know, if, if you're dealing with a sales broker and and you're asking them to refer somebody, it's kind of industry standard that they're going to give you three names. These are kind of the expectations that you can have of a sales broker. We don't necessarily have that on the property management side. There's a lot of diversity on kind of what their industry practices are when they're doing property management. Some are going to pull criminal history checks. Some are going to do credit checks. Hopefully, they're going to outline those duties in the written agreement that they have with the consumer. But we don't quite have the standard duties with the property managing brokers as we do with the sales brokers. So that can be an issue when you start to decide that you're going to go and, you know, supplement your income by doing property management. If you're not aware of all the different nuances of property management, that can lead you down the complaint process really quickly. Another issue that we see is the issue of trust accounts. A lot of the time when brokers start to dabble in property management, the trust account issue is something that they haven't had to deal with in sales because a lot of our brokers, we're aware, you know, if you get earnest money deposit or an earnest money deposit, it gets, you transfer it to the title company. A lot of the time the title company deals with it. We don't have very many brokers that have their own trust accounts at this point. Trust accounts are the norm with property managers. They don't have a title company managing those accounts. So we start to see that for some reason with property management, Funds of others, this is a concept that eludes the brokers that are practicing property management. It becomes funds of their own. So we've had a couple brokers where they've done property management and they've used the rental income and security deposits to fund their operating expenses and their overhead and their businesses. And when we start to see that, we start to have a conversation with them about when they would like to surrender the license before or after we report it to criminal law enforcement. Because most of the time, what we've been seeing in the trend with brokers that do property management, when I started at the division, one of the most egregious property management cases that we had was a deficiency of $80,000. So a couple years ago, we went out, well, we got a complaint about somebody that was doing property management, and they raised the bar to a $150,000 deficiency. And then a year ago, we went out and re-audited the company that had the $80,000 deficiency when I started. And 
That company had pretty much experienced the revocation of three employing brokers' licenses over that period of about three or four years. So we go out, lo and behold, the deficiency has not shrunk. It has expanded to the $275,000. So now ER number four no longer has a license. This past year we went out and did, we had a complaint and we went out and did an audit and we re reached an all-time high that we really didn't want to see. It was a $342,000 deficiency that we know of. Now, the attorney had not shut off his cell phone when he was talking to my expedited settlement manager. And he continued to carry on a conversation with somebody that was sitting in the car with them after he thought he'd hung up on Penny. And what he indicated to the person that was riding in the car was, they have no clue this is the tip of the iceberg. Okay, well, so that broker doesn't have a license. And what we look at when we start to see those types of de deficiencies is the commission, by statute, does not have the authority to order restitution. We can, as a settlement agreement, request and, you know, contractually require that a broker uh, pay back restitution, but we can't order it. So if somebody's going to go through the hearing process, they're not going to get restitution. And really, our goal when we start to see those deficiencies, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to impose restitution, but that's typically not just a civil issue, it's a criminal issue, and the criminal courts can deal with restitution. We're going to deal with the license. Somebody with a deficiency that high shouldn't be practicing. They're a danger to the public. So that's really going to be the commission's focus. We do from time to time see deficiencies that it's $1,000, and there's been an accounting issue, and we'll work with people to bring them into compliance and make sure the deficiency is adjusted. But on the extreme ones where you see a $342,000 deficiency, the past two that we've done, the 175000 and the 300000 one, those brokerages ended up getting acquired by another brokerage that their intent is to fix the deficiency. So we're going to monitor the acquisition. We don't play an active role in it, but we need to monitor it because at some point we're going to go out and do an audit of that brokerage, and it's not fair for us to impose penalties on them for an issue that predated the acquisition of the company. But we also want to make sure that they're addressing those deficiencies so that the consumers at some point are going to be made whole or that they know what avenue they need to go down uh, to get pretty much made whole for their losses. A lot of what we also see is we see brokers that will sign up with a brokerage that does sales, and that's all they do, and they make it clear we only do sales, and then you've got a broker associate that says, well, but I want to do property management, and we have an employing broker that says, well, so this is a sales-only brokerage, you need to go do it on your own. No. All of their at licensed activity is required to run through the employing broker. The only cave caveat to that is when they're dealing with their own personal property. And that's going to depend on your brokerage policies. If the employing broker wants even the personal transactions to run through, that needs to be clear in the policy manual. Um, but essentially, if you're going to go and manage Aunt Betty's property, it doesn't matter that she's your Aunt Betty. That requires a real estate broker's license, and that needs to be run through the employing broker. Now, the employing broker can delegate some of their authority and say, OK, we'll set up trust accounts, and you're going to be kind of a signer on these but the employing broker still needs to be on the trust account, and if there's trust account issues, not only are we going to start asking questions of the broker performing the property management, we're going to ask questions of the employing broker because there's supervision issues. One of the thing that, things that has become clear in the past few months is there's a lot of confusion also about the commission-approved forms regarding property management and when they get used. And these are reflective of how pretty much that segment of the brokerage population does not have real consistent business practices. I got asked by a group of property managers within the last couple months when you use an exclusive right to lease versus when you use a property management agreement. And if there's anybody that's inclined to do property management, here's a quick lesson on the differences of those forms. Exclusive right to lease is that one-shot deal where you're just going to lease their property and you're not going to have a lasting relationship with them. It's typically you find the tenant and then you're done. The property management agreement is pretty much an attachment to whatever agreement you may have that's drawn up by an attorney 
And this is the long-term practice of property management where you're procuring their tenants, you know, it may be for years, whatever the case may be, you're dealing with property maintenance, and you're, you're dealing with the day-to-day -day nuances of property management. So, I mean, even the form usage is not clear to the practitioners in that particular field. Another issue that we're seeing is with team names. So pretty much the easiest way to go about using a team, and we understand that there's benefits to having a team. You don't have to be the, the on-call broker 24-7, 365 days a year. You can split those duties up among several brokers. Um, so we understand that. We just don't want the teams to be advertised in a way that makes the consumer think that they're an independent brokerage, aside from the one that you actually hang your license with. And so what we're seeing, and I really do not want to become the advertising or the font police, we've seen lately a couple complaints about teams, and you've got the yard sign, and like 95% of the yard sign advertises the Marsha Waters Realty Action Team. And in very small font, it indicates that Marsha Waters works for ABC 123 Realty. Okay, so the consumer is not going to know that the broker works for ABC 123 Realty. So when you start looking at your advertisements, take a step back, use common sense, and say, okay, if I was a consumer, who, who would I think I worked for? Do I think I worked for Marsha Waters Realty Action Team? Which, if we see Realty in a team name, we're going to have a chat because that alludes down the path that it's an independent brokerage. And we've pretty much told you in the position statement, don't use real estate, realty, nothing that would otherwise confuse the consumer into thinking that it's a brokerage. But we don't also want to have to go out and come up with commission rules that say that you've got to advertise the brokerage firm in, you know, 16-point font on a yard sign or, you know, an X font on a paper advertisement. We don't want to go down that road. Just please use common sense if you have a team and you're doing advertisements. One of the other areas that keep us very busy, and this isn't necessarily a public complaint, all of us got to go through it well, I didn't. I was fortunately inactive. But for those that were active during the years of 2005, 2006, and 2007, you got to go through the joys of fingerprinting at the time of renewal. Well, it didn't stop at the time of renewal. What it amounts to is we get hits from the CBI, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, for all of our brokers when they have run-ins with the law. So if you robbed a bank yesterday, chances are we got a hit this morning saying, hey, so-and-so got arrested for bank robbery. And bank robbery would be one of those criminal offenses that the commission is concerned about. <laughs> they don't need to know all of them, but there is a whole laundry list, and a lot of people are under the impression that they only have to report felonies to the commission. That's not the case. Misdemeanors fall under the laundry list of criminal convictions. And based on what it is, we don't, we start tracking when we get the, the alert that somebody's been arrested. It doesn't become a commission license law issue until the person has pled guilty or been convicted, and it has to be one of the laundry list of crimes under 1261-113-1M. And we've seen some, I don't even know how they got these plea agreements. They should thank their local district attorney's office if they've, you know, been arrested for attempted murder and it gets pled down to like, you know, firing agricultural lands. Uh, we've seen some bizarre ones. In some cases, even though there's been the, the plea to something that's outside of the laundry list, if the behavior pinpoints to something that should have been in that list of crimes, we might look into it. But for the most part, as soon as we've, we're going to track and once the plea of guilt or the conviction comes down, we expect the broker to notify the commission within 30 days that there's been a plea of guilt or a conviction. Chances are we're going to beat you to the punch on that one, though. But just so you know, you have 30 days, and that's by commission rule. The commission's then going to evaluate the conviction uh, to pretty much assess what's the consumer harm, what's the potential that this person could be a danger to society, was the crime... Uh, done in connection with real estate. That one can jeopardize your license significantly. So uh, for the most part over the years what we've seen is if you've been convicted of sexual assault, attempted murder, 
Those typically don't require, you know, involve your clients. Those, the commission saying, no, we don't want to license you with those client crimes. The ones that involve the clients, though, that we're seeing is burglarizing your own listings. Yeah, we don't want you in the uh, business if you're burglarizing your own listing. That's not good. We've also seen brokers file forged documents with the county, and when you start you know, forging deeds of trust or whatever it may be, the commission says, no, you know, that's connected to real property. We don't want you committing crimes that are in correlation with real property. So the commission has bid adieu to those people as well. We do see people that, you know, fortunately with the real estate brokers, you guys don't seem to be involved as ma in as many violent persons' crimes as some of our other licensees. So a lot of what we see are, you know, you've got a broker that gets involved in a bar fight. They're charged with third degree assault, which is a class one misdemeanor. The commission's going to look at that and say, eh, we don't think that you're a danger to the public. So it doesn't have anything to do with your real estate license. However, it is a violation of the license law. You're going to get a fine and you may get public censure. We have had a couple that... We had one hire an undercover Denver police officer to kill his wife, which fortunately he hired an undercover Denver police officer, so his wife is still alive and kicking. He's not licensed, because we were like, no, if you're going to hire somebody to kill the one you love, we can only imagine what you would do to somebody who would stiff you for a commission. <laughs> and at the time of application, we see a lot of people that will apply for a broker's license that have had um, drug convictions. And so one of the things that we kind of start sitting there and mulling over then is, okay, well, brokers have a tendency to drive people around in their car, so is this a driving-related offense? Is it something to worry about? DUI is not something that you have to report to the commission. Thank goodness, because I don't know that we'd have too many real estate brokers, because we do see that a lot. There's a lot of DUIs. 